in an unusual and impromptu alliance of eight nations. The 55-day siege of Peking, as part of the wider Boxer Rebellion of 1900, illustrated a stalwart defense against overwhelming odds, as these foreign powers stood against the might of the Chinese Dowager Empress and thousands of outraged citizens who worked to unseat the military outsiders from their home. The situation of the wider Boxer Rebellion was owed to a general political and social unrest within the mighty Qing dynasty of ancient China, where due to technical change and international meddling, the near 500-year-old dynasty was being torn apart primarily due to the various inefficiencies of its largely outdated government and military force, which was easily outmatched by the modern weaponry and technology of the European powers. These mighty nations quickly moving to pick apart the dynasty, primarily through the annexation or purchase of leases on strategic harbors and ports along the coast of mainland China, including Hong Kong, Macau, and Xingzhou, with the nations of Great Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Russia having taken various pieces of the titanic country by the end of the 1800s, with even Japan, as a once notoriously isolationist power, adopting many of the political and military facets of the European empires that rapidly served to make it a power far superior in terms of technical might against imperial China, as demonstrated in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895, in which the factions of the Qing dynasty were easily routed, and in so doing saw the conquest of the Korean peninsula by the Japanese empire. With the foreign powers having successfully established themselves in China, bribery and threats quickly followed that induced the Chinese government to grant mining, railroad and other business concessions to foreign companies, which led to severe increases in unemployment, with Chinese miners losing their livelihoods when their mines were handed over to European interests, while a railroad from Peking to the coast threw thousands of rivermen and teamsters out of work. These problems compounded by a severe drought during 1899 that destroyed that year's harvest and sent thousands of starving peasants to the cities, the colonists enforcing their presence in China through the privilege of extraterritoriality, which thereby made them immune to Chinese laws and possible prosecution under the Chinese legal system, with foreign troops and police controlling railroads and occupying the ports and townships that fell under colonial control, exacerbated further by the arrival of Western missionaries who were allowed to spread the word of Christianity across China that rapidly worked to displace the ancient religions of the nation and thereby breed open hostility among the notoriously traditional population. In the 1890s, the Emperor Kuang Zhu, notable for his more reformist political stance, attempted to strengthen his country through modernization similar to that adopted by Japan, his rise to the throne of the Qing dynasty being engineered by his aunt, the Dowager Empress Zixi, who herself, through her formidable intelligence and strong political acumen, had risen from an imperial concubine to perhaps the most powerful person in China though her considerable skills were employed in propping up the corrupt, inefficient, and conservatively elite Qing dynasty, Zixi being strongly opposed to her nephew's reforms, thus leading to his disposition and house arrest within the forbidden city in Peking, her traditionalist mindset going hand in hand with the growing resentment of the peasant classes across the countryside and villages of northern China against foreign influence due to the huge damage caused through unemployment and famine, leading to the rapid growth of a new nationalist movement dubbed the Ai Ho Chuan, or the Righteous and Harmonious Fists their first moves against the foreign powers being the murder of missionaries and other Westerners, together with the destruction of businesses and properties, these attacks catching the attention of the European colonists, who dubbed the movement and its followers as the Boxers. Mixing modern tactics with religion and superstition, the Boxers employed the use of heavy publicity with printed flyers and posters, while at the same time preaching to their followers that through the training of special forms of martial arts and ritual spells, they would be able to deflect the bullets of foreign guns as illustrated through somewhat fraudulent demonstrations, where a boxer leader would be fired upon by rifles loaded with blanks, though these efforts proved highly successful, as thousands were convinced to join the boxer cause, identifying themselves through red sashes and armbands, while in favour of guns, swords, spears and other traditional weapons were adopted to fight the cause, the empress and the court watching the growing disorder of the boxer rebellion, which had no single leader, and thus had no sole head of the movement that could be killed, while the murder of missionaries and their families caused diplomatic pressure from the West that threatened to spill over into all-out war, a concern added to by the fear that the boxers could potentially blame the imperial family for the current condition of China and its ability to be easily picked apart by the foreign interlopers, thus causing a revolution that could unseat the monarchy. The Empress Sixi, therefore, revoking an earlier condemnation she had placed on the boxers during early 1900 and therefore presented them with a tacit sign of endorsement. The center of the Boxer Rebellion soon converged on Peking, the heart of China's imperial dynasty, boasting, by 1900, a population of one million people, 
that live behind walls 30 foot thick and 20 feet high in the southern section known as the Chinese city. While to the north, the Tartar Wall, 40 foot high and 50 feet wide, surrounded the ancient Tartar city that housed the nobility, within which was another set of walls for the elite imperial city, inside of which was the inner domain of the imperial family, the Forbidden City, into which not even the highest of dynastic aristocrats could enter unless invited, the imperial city and Tartar Wall, surrounding what was known as the Legation Quarter, where foreign diplomats, merchants and bankers lived, with most of the foreign establishments being arrayed along Legation Street which ran east to west to the north of the Tartar Wall, while the disused and shallow Imperial Canal, running north to south, also bisected the quarter, the British having the biggest legation, followed by the Russian and French compounds, while the United States, Japan, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Italy, Spain, Belgium and the Netherlands occupied their own smaller legations in the district, each national legation comprising a combination embassy, residence and social club for their ambassador, usually called a minister, staff and other visitors, the legations often being restricted to a single structure but not solely the case for larger legations, with the British complex covering three acres that included the minister's house, several office buildings, quarters for servants and employees, and a chapel, theatre, bowling green, surgery and cemetery, all legations being surrounded by foreign-owned stores, businesses and banks. While the diplomats and merchants of the legation quarter were generally safe within their various complexes, the news of the Boxer Rebellion and their violence against foreign missionaries and businesses across regional China gave cause for concern with the British Minister, Sir Claude Maxwell MacDonald, requesting assistance by way of additional troops on May 27, 1900, on behalf of all the various foreign representatives within the district, though regular army units were too far away to assist, while the nearest military factions were marine troops stationed aboard ships patrolling the Chinese coast, alongside an emergency force of warships from eight different nations, anchored at the mouth of the Peiho River at Taku, 100 miles southeast of Peking, relief arriving between May 31st and June 4th, in the form of U.S. Marines from the battleship USS Oregon and the protected cruiser USS Newark, as commanded by Captain John T. Myers, these troops bringing with them a varied collection of modern weapons, including primitive machine guns mounted on wheels, while the British employed Nordenfeld four-barreled rapid-firing one-pounder guns that had originally been designed for naval use. The arrival of the Americans was well-timed, as only a day later, on June 5th, Boxer insurgents cut the railroad between Peking and the coast with their distinctive red-clad followers soon appearing within the city itself, publicly inciting violence and provoking the destruction of the Peking racecourse as a symbol of Western culture and leisure, MacDonald dispatching a message to British Vice Admiral Edward Seymour requesting further reinforcements with all possible speed. While on June 11th, the violence of the Boxer uprising spread inside the quarter when Japanese minister Sugiyama Akira was slain by Imperial Chinese troops while on his way to a meeting with other government representatives followed shortly thereafter by the murder of German minister Clemens von Kettler on June 20th by a boy believed to be aligned with the Boxer cause. The murder of these two ministers being set against the background of churches, foreign businesses and the homes of Chinese Christians being burned by Boxer rebels throughout the course of the week. Matters coming fully to a head on June 19th when the Chinese imperial government's foreign office offered safe passage out of Peking if the western colonists in the legation quarter left the city immediately. This proposal not being taken up by the ministers, due to their lack of faith that the promise of safe passage would be upheld by the dynastic powers, instead choosing to fortify their positions and await Admiral Seymour's relief column dispatched from the Chinese coast. With the Chinese imperial offer turned down, the fighting truly commenced from the following day, as in the aftermath of von Kettler's brutal death that morning, boxer mobs began to open fire on the legation quarter as supported by imperial troops. The quarter, at the beginning of the siege, comprising 473 civilians, 407 military personnel from eight nations, and approximately 3,000 Chinese Christians who had sought refuge from the boxers out in the wider city and surrounding countryside. The Dowager Empress Sixi officially declaring war on the foreign powers on June 21, 1900. The foreign nationals and Chinese Christians working hard to set up a strong defense through the building of barricades from bricks and sandbags, the latter of which were sewn by women inside the quarter, and were made from any materials that could be stripped from clothes, buildings, and businesses ranging from luxurious silk and satin tapestries to robes and curtains. The defensive perimeter stretching from the Tartar Wall that covered the main ramp near the American legation, east past the Imperial Canal, to a point near the German legation, though this left out the Belgian, Dutch, Italian and Austrian legations, the key to the defence being control of the high wall, as this could not be surrendered to the boxers under any circumstances, as it would allow them to fire down into the legation quarter with impunity. Should the boxers break the outer defence, the British complex, as the largest of those present in the legation quarter, would be the last stand, 
with its 10-foot-high wall and provision of several wells, meaning those inside could mount a sustained and long-term resistance against their Chinese adversaries. The garrison being strengthened by two bands of civilian volunteers, one of which comprised up to 75 civilians with previous military experience, armed with spare rifles, 31 of whom were Japanese citizens. This volunteer regiment fighting alongside the marines and sailors on the outer wall, while the second group of 50 men formed an irregular unit to guard the British compound, and were armed with an unusual assortment of weapons, including an elephant gun, while those not provided firearms made use of carving knives and other blades repurposed from domestic uses such as kitchens and gardens. The highest-ranking military officer present during the siege being Captain Eduard von Thormann of the Austrian cruiser Zenta, who took command of the legation forces from June 21st, though his ability to manage the defence was undermined from the very next day, when after hearing rumour that the Americans had abandoned their legation, he issued a panicked order to have all foreign forces retreat back to the British complex for a final stand against the boxers. Word soon reaching the ministers that this retreat had been predicated on false information, and thus led the entire legation quarter essentially defenceless, though this blunder was quickly rectified before the boxers could press home their advantage. Therefore, with von Thoman having nearly cost them the entire defence, MacDonald assumed military command with the consent of the Western ministers and officers, MacDonald having previously served with the British Army during the 1870s and 80s when fighting the forces of the Mahdi in Egypt and during campaigns across West Africa, with Herbert G. Squires, Secretary of the American Legation, serving as his Chief of Staff, Squires also being experienced in combat as he had previously held the rank of First Lieutenant in the American 7th Cavalry during the Sioux Uprising of the 1890s. June 23rd and 24th, seeing continued fighting that required the International Legation to demolish buildings of the Hanlin Academy, so as to remove their potential for use as firing positions by the boxers. While an attempt by the rebels to burn out the foreigners through the setting of fires within the neighbourhood structures was thwarted by an effective firefighting campaign. The only other enclave of Western power outside the legation quarter being the Peytan Cathedral of Bishop August Favier, two miles away, that was defended by priests and nuns, 3,000 Chinese Christian refugees, 30 French and 11 Italian marines. Beyond Peking, Admiral Seymour and his relief column of 2,200 men also faced difficulty as they attempted to travel the 100 miles from the coast at Tongyu by way of trains propelling armoured flat cars carrying troops with machine guns and cannons ahead of the locomotive. Seymour being unaware that troops loyal to the dynastic government had sided with the boxers, and therefore underestimated how long it would take for his troops to travel by rail to the imperial capital. Their progress bogged down by constant repairs having to be administered to the track work as boxer rebels tore up the rails. The movement of troops by train proceeding 60 miles to Langfang, after which a heavily damaged bridge across the Peiho River, meant the heavy trains could no longer proceed, forcing Seymour to march his column along the banks of the river towards Tianxin, a major city at the intersection of the Peiho and Grand Canal, about 30 miles from the coast. Seymour arriving to find Tianxin, also under siege as 2,300 Western troops attempted to repel boxer and imperial forces, among them being future President of the United States, Herbert Hoover, who used his experience as a civil engineer to design fortifications, constructing a two-mile-long barricade made of bales of wool or camel hair and bags filled with peanuts, sugar and rice. Ultimately, with Seymour's force and the international defence bogged down at Tianxin, Allied commanders aboard warships anchored off the coast, who had previously been hesitant to escalate the situation further by landing a large-scale force on the Chinese mainland, barraged the imperial fortress at Taku before dispatching troops to relieve Tianxin on June 23rd, followed on June 26th by the relief of Seymour's force at Siku, approximately six miles from Tianxin, by a faction of primarily Russian and British troops under the command of Commodore David Beatty of the HMS Balfour, Beatty later gaining notoriety for his command of the British fleet of battlecruisers at the 1916 Battle of Jutland during World War I, the ever-increasing violence of the emergency in China being enough to demand further troops be sent to support the Allied factions in Peking with 1,300 men of the American 9th Infantry, who were already fighting an insurrection in the Philippines, arriving in Tianzhen on July 11th, eventually unseating the boxers from the city three days later after a long battle rife with heavy casualties. Back in Peking, the defence continued to hold well in the legation quarter, but was not without incident, with July 1st seeing US Marines stationed on the Tartar Wall facing off against Chinese forces that captured the largely undefended western end of the bastion that was difficult to remove their snipers presenting a persistent and accurate threat to the American line, while during the night of June 30th to July 1st, the Chinese brought up three field guns to their own barricade facing the Germans, forcing the withdrawal of the smaller German force that left the Marine barricade open to enemy fire from the rear, 
the Americans, together with a contingent of British Royal Marines, being able to retake their positions after 15 minutes of brutal fighting. Though the German position had been lost, Imperial Chinese and Boxer forces working throughout July 2nd to build their own defensive wall against any possible American counterattack, followed by the creation of a tower under cover of darkness that provided a commanding view of the American line, the foreign allies responding by launching a mission early on the morning of July 3rd to destroy the tower, as enacted by 14 US Marines, 15 Russians, and 26 British Marines and volunteers. This surprise attack driving away the unprepared Chinese defenders and pushing them back 100 yards to their next barricade on the Tartar Wall. Having failed to overwhelm the foreign legation in swift order, the Chinese soon increased the pressure of their siege, with snipers and artillery gunners firing into the district constantly, while for psychological effect, and to deprive the defenders of sleep, fireworks were set off by the boxers to keep their rivals awake and on guard, one of the more notable weapons used by the Imperial troops being the infamous Jingal musket, a gigantic reproduction of a Western equivalent that was up to six feet long and could only be operated by a crew of two men. The Chinese ability to have a consistent artillery force being perhaps the biggest concern for the Allies, as their only significant piece was a sole Italian one-pounder gun that ran on a very strict ration of ammunition. Though on July 7th, Chinese workers digging a trench uncovered an old muzzle-loading bronze cannon barrel of Anglo-French origin that was left behind during the 1862nd Opium War the gun being restored to working order and mounted atop a spare Italian carriage, while firing nine-pounder shells as provided by the Russian legation. The use of this gun, nicknamed Old Betsy and the Dowager Empress, being officially known as the International Gun, as it utilised a British barrel, sat atop an Italian carriage, and was fired by American gunners using Russian shells. From July 13th, a new and disturbing strategy was uncovered, when Chinese miners were enlisted to dig tunnels beneath the legation district in order to deposit bombs under the various buildings, as demonstrated when two mines were detonated beneath the French legation that killed two sailors and collapsed several buildings. Though at the same time multiple boxers and imperial troops failed to escape back down their impromptu tunnels in time and were also killed in the explosion, the destruction of the French legation forcing the defenders back to the German lines, which themselves were pushed back by a boxer charge that descended into hand-to-hand -hand combat with bayonets the situation in the legation quarter becoming increasingly dire as water was rationed and the dead lay unburied and rotted under the hot July sun, which also attracted hordes of flies and mosquitoes. Not helped by the publishing of false reports by the boxers, so as to dissuade any potential relief column by the foreign allies reaching Peking, that the defenders in the legation quarter had been overrun by the Chinese and slaughtered to a man. Though such stories only served to warrant the dispatch of further troops to China, with 20,000 men eventually being sent from French, British, American, German, Italian, Japanese, Russian and Austro-Hungarian factions to support those trapped in Peking. Heavy fighting continued in Peking throughout the course of July, with various fallbacks and advances occurring between the Chinese and colonist forces that were punctuated by various ceasefires, the first of which occurred for a week from July 17th, in which the imperial court sent shipments of sweet melons, flour and ice into the legation quarter, while a second took place on July 27th, which again lasted for a week, and allowed the foreigners some respite until August 4th, these mysterious manoeuvres by the imperial court reflecting a prominent division between the Chinese bureaucrats, with one side seeking to support the boxers and destroy the foreign presence, while others considered that doing so would encourage a full conquest by the far stronger and more technologically advanced Western powers. This lack of a single policy towards the matter being illustrated in that the Dowager Empress did not commit the full weight of her imperial army towards overrunning the legation district, and only provided a token support force to give the boxers assistance when necessary. Eventually, news of the 20,000 strong force of allied relief columns approaching Peking demanded the destruction of the legation district with all possible haste, with August 4th marking renewed fighting between the foreigners, dynastic troops and boxers that saw continual skirmishes for the next nine days after which the Allies arrived in Peking and put the Boxer rebels to flight. The final assault on Peking, though somewhat disjointed and clumsily executed by various international factions, vying to be the ones to successfully overcome the imperial capital, finally seeing the legation quarter relieved at around 3pm by troops of the 7th Rajaputs of the British Indian Army under General Alfred Gasly, bringing an end to a 55-day siege of the foreign compounds, the last Boxer resistance in Peking being mopped up gradually, with the small garrison at the Pei Tang Cathedral finally being rescued two days later by Japanese soldiers. The Dowager Empress escaping with the court on August 15th, disguised as a peasant, before Allied troops broke down the gates and occupied the Forbidden City, evacuating to Ziyan in the Shaanxi province of central China. The final death toll among the legation quarter's defenders 
being 76 dead and 169 wounded, against an untold number of Chinese casualties, either those killed in the actual fighting or as a result of collateral damage caused by Boxer and Imperial artillery shells overshooting their targets and hitting neighbouring districts in the city. In the aftermath of the siege, on September 7, 1900, the defeated Chinese officials signed the Boxer Protocol, in which China accepted blame for the Boxer Rebellion and agreed to pay massive damages, while those powers with continued notions towards expansionism into China further annexed portions of the country in exchange for reparations, the most notable being Russia's takeover of the Qing dynasty's spiritual origin of Manchuria, which brought the European empire within dangerous proximity to the Japanese territories of Korea and would ultimately be one of the pivotal factors behind the later Russo-Japanese War of 1905, the Dowager Empress remaining in exile in Xi'an until January 1902, after which she was allowed to return to the Forbidden City, her humiliation in the wake of the Boxer Rebellion seeing her adopt various reforms that would reshape the future of China prior to her eventual death in November 1908 at the age of 72, one day after the young emperor Guangzhou, and was ultimately succeeded by the two-year-old Pu Yi as the last emperor of China, who would reign until February 12, 1912, when the Qing dynasty ended upon his abdication, creating a corrupt and largely dysfunctional republic under its first president, Sun Yat-sen. Ultimately, the Eight-Nation Alliance would only be a fleeting part of history, as with the imperative for surviving the onslaught of the Boxer Rebellion now dissolved, each of the colonial powers rapidly returned to supporting their own individual interests, and throughout the course of the next decade would eventually see each of them engaged in vicious conflicts that would decide the fate of modern history. Although for a brief moment, the nations of Austria-Hungary, the British Empire, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia and the United States were unified under a single banner, to defend themselves deep within the boundaries of a foreign land against overwhelming forces stoked by nationalism and outrage at their intrusion within sovereign China.